You're listening to the weekly dance cast. One hundred and eighty. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the weekly dance cast. I'm Alex Moss and we're back after taking last week off. Well, I'm back. My regular co-host Burton Dewitt is still enjoying himself on his holidays. Hello, Burton, if you're listening. But I'm pleased to say, stepping into the hot seat, we have a special guest co-host. He is the host of the Inside the WDF podcast, the runner-up in this year's Darts Podcast Lakeside World Championship. It is, of course, Andrew Sinclair. Thanks for joining us this week. Andrew, how are you doing? Good. Thank you, mate. Glad to, to be back on. And the fact I didn't make a tit of myself on my first appearance uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's good to be back. Well, you did, but we enjoyed it so much. We wanted you to do it again. But no, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you on and doing well at this end as well. We've got lots to get to on the show. We're going to look back on the Euro Tour. We'll look ahead to the World Series finals. And as we've got you on, Andrew, we should chat a little bit about the WDF and a, a bit of ADC and, and Modus League as, as well. We've got a few guests as well. But let's start with the Euro Tour, the German Darts Open at the weekend. Peter Wright winning the title on Sunday night, beating Dimitri van der Berg 8-6 in the final. It was Peter's first Euro Tour title in five years, but I guess... More importantly for him, his second event back after surgery and he's come away with the title. We're now into this traditional busy final third of the season in the PDC. So have you seen enough already from those two events from Peter to suggest that he is ready to go on and win another major title? Yeah, I I mean, I guess you have to caveat everything with Peter in the sense that he'll look really good one week and then change his darts and then will, you know, maybe not be as good or... And there'll be a result or something that, that isn't quite the same as, as the way he was playing the week before. But no, I, I've been very impressed. The first two events back, the, the first Euro Tour, just over a week ago, he lost in his first game to, to Jim Williams, but he played very well in that game, had the second highest losing average of that round. And I think the third highest losing average uh, of the whole weekend. And he mismatched arts in that game against Jim as well. So you know, say he takes one of those darts out at, at double 16, then does he then go on a deep run that weekend as well? Because the standard he was playing, he certainly would have been amongst the favourites. And then this weekend played very well. And it, it wasn't just that he played well in certain games. He played well and consistently well. I think it was, you know, 99 in one round, 98, 100, 100 and so on. So playing at a very good consistent level. And if he can maintain that, then yeah. He's right in that conversation to to be one of the favourites for this business end of the season because there's no one else that's playing outstandingly well where you'd feel, you know, Peter looks good, but, you know, he's not on the level that Gezi is or or MVG is. I think there's a bit of fatigue for some of them and uh, some of them aren't quite in the form they were maybe a few months ago or maybe a year ago. So I think if he can play like he did in, in Jena over the weekend, then he'll definitely be at the business end for sure. Yeah, that is an interesting point you make there as well. I mean, this year in particular is the first year that we've had that full schedule back for the PDC with not just the Euro Tour 13 events, we've also had the World Series events as well. But for Peter Wright missing that block of World Series events in Australia and New Zealand, he's had that break for the surgery and he's come back. He's looked refreshed and I think he's already said that he's going to be playing in everything for the rest of the year. So that tells you how refreshed he is we'll, we'll see if he's going to say the same thing in a, in a few weeks time after he's done a bit more traveling but looking at how he's performed since he's come back you mentioned the game with Jim Williams where Jim Williams you've got to give him some credit in that game as well five three down took out 125 with Peter waiting on tops next leg he takes out 100 for an 11 data Peter waiting on 32 and as you say he had the the match starts Peter there but Jim had the first go at the double missed it and managed to get another chance to get over the line in that one but I think leaving that event even though he did lose the first round, I think Peter Wright would have been happy that his game was in a reasonably good place and to then follow it up this past weekend, go on and, and win the title. And some good names that he's beaten in there, Raymond Van Barneveld, of course, Johnny Clayton, Ross Smith, Joe Cullen and Dimitri Vandenberg in the final as well. And, you know, there was points in them games where he really has made his mark and, and shown that class of a two-time world champion and, and someone that not so long ago was the world number one. I mean, you look at the end of the game with Dimitri, six all, and Peter breaks in 15, holds in 13. He had the, the 160 finish in there, the ball finish for a 10 dart. We, we all love to see that. So I think the signs are good for Peter Wright. And it's a good point you make there as well about the darts as well. We did see him use a, a new set of darts these last few weeks. We don't know whether they're going to make it to Holland this weekend or he's going to go with something else. But I think given what we've seen, two events back so far, if, if you're a Peter Wright fan, I think you're going to be 
happy with where his game's at because there's always this question mark, isn't there, when a player takes a, a little bit of a break out of the game and Peter Wright's someone that very rarely takes a, a break from the game. So for him to come back and get a title, second event back, I think he, he's going to be happy with that. Peter Wright fans are going to be happy and he'll be hoping that there's going to be more titles and bigger ones to come just around the corner as well. Oh, definitely. And you don't go for a 10 data on the ball unless you're feeling confident. And if you've had a break and, you know, maybe you weren't feeling super sharp, maybe you don't go for that. Maybe you try and, you know, lay it up with a, a single 10 first or whatever. So he's obviously feeling supremely confident up there as well. And, you know, he's one of those players that, you know, when he's confident and he's in the zone, he's probably the best in the world. And you've got to think that, it, you know, if before he went off, he was struggling with the the gallstones and whatever, maybe he wasn't at his best in the run-up to, to going for the surgery. So maybe now he feels he can play with, you know, full freedom and so on. And yeah, you go into the back half of the year and, you know, one good run, you're playing big tournaments all the time. That momentum can snowball and take you all the way to, to December. And then suddenly your odds on favourite for, for the world championship. So yeah, he definitely seems to be in a, a good place, but I guess this weekend will be another indication as well if he can kind of maintain that as an unseeded player, as it were, in the World Series finals. Yeah, we'll come on to look ahead to the World Series in a moment, but just sticking with the Euro Tour and I guess a question away from the hockey end, it's been something that has been talked about quite a bit on social media, was uh, talked about a lot more at the weekend as well with a, a few more withdrawals, and that is the players pulling out of the Euro Tour events we saw Four at the weekend. John Thompson, one of our listeners, has been in touch and he said it's got to be a question for the next podcast. What can the PDC do to prevent this? Move the host nation qualifier back to the day before, increase DRA sanctions for people withdrawing for no reason, both something else. What are your thoughts on the continued withdrawals that we're seeing before these Euro Tour events? It's hugely frustrating for the PDC, presumably, but also fans at home, you know, and fans in the venue, you're paying for a full session of darts. And if you have what you had at the weekend with four players not there, that meant that the two sessions look a bit more abridged. I think the PDC have got to do something because you want those tournaments to have the full complement of players because then it's a, you know, a fair test of ability. And you don't want it to be that come the end of the season, someone's losing out on a tour card by maybe a grand or a couple of grand. And that's because someone ended up getting a buy in a Euro tour and then ended up pocketing money that maybe they wouldn't have done if they'd had to, to play someone or maybe they've not quote unquote earned that extra money. So I think they've got to, to do something. I don't fully, I don't have a, a complete understanding of the rules, but there's presumably got to be a deadline for the players to confirm whether they're playing or not. Uh, and I wonder whether there needs to be changes to where that the way that deadline works. So then they've got more time to source alternative players. I seem to think that the associate member qualifier, or maybe it was the host nation one, I can't remember. They did like a, a playoff between the guys who, who lost the semifinals, I think. And I thought it was to set up, you know, reserves for future tournaments, but they don't appear to have been used or uh, whatever. But I, I think there's got to be a system in which there are reserves. I don't know whether that's, as you say, you do the host nation qualifier the, the day before, as you used to do, or whether you just run kind of backups through the associate member qualifiers or the, the host nation qualifiers when you do them so that these two players are in and then say the semi-finalists play each other and you know, whoever wins is then first reserve and then whoever loses is second reserve, for example. And you call them in the way that you'd call players for the pro tour. But I, I do think they've got to, to do something because it is in some ways undermining the, the credibility of the, the tournament. Well, looking at this event that we've just had at the weekend and we'll do a bit of impromptu trivia for you here, Andrew. We've just had this Euro Tour. It was on the 9th to the 11th of September 2022. When do you think the host nation qualifier took place for this Euro Tour event? Oh, gosh. I remember there were a block of them. I seem to think it was a couple of months ago. So I'll say July. 23rd of April, 2022. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is part of the problem, isn't it? We, I'm not sure when it exactly changed. It might have been pre-pandemic, but we did used to have those host nation qualifiers take place the night before the Euro Tour event. So the Thursday evening, we'd have all the players turn up and 
we didn't know how many spots there'd be. Of course, there'd be the the two or three. And then if there were players that had withdrawn on the Tuesday or the Wednesday or, or the Thursday morning, whatever, they'd add those spots to the qualifier, wouldn't they? So that was a, an easy fix, wasn't it? But um, again, I'm not quite sure when it changed, but we now have all these host nation qualifiers taking place at various different stages during the year. And I think a, a lot of the German ones, they were bunched together this year. So that Euro Tour 11, as it was at the weekend, took place in September. The the host nation qualifiers took place back in April. Now, not sure on the exact reasoning behind the change. Was it due to maybe saving the costs for players, travelling to one venue, getting to play in several qualifiers in one day rather than going to one qualifier for each time? Or, or maybe it was just, I don't know, setting things up to run the qualifier the night before. Maybe that's a question we can uh, try and get to Matt Porter or, or someone at the PDC when we next try and get them on and, and see what they think. But it is something that is, is getting a lot of debate and we saw it on the commentary as well from the PDC at the weekend. I think Chris Murphy and Mark Webster were, were talking about it as well. So, you know, it is something that I'm sure the PDC have noticed. And I look back at 2019, that was the last year we had 13 Euro Tour events and we had seven withdrawals. We've had 11 events so far in 2022. We've got two more to come and we've already had 24. So that is a, a big jump, isn't it? And okay, some of them are players that have pulled out mid-tournament. I think we had James Wade and Peter Wright pull out due to health reasons. Uh, Dimitri Vandenberg at the weekend, before his semi-final, he was receiving medical attention. So there are instances where these withdrawals, that they can't be helped mid-event, but I guess really before the event is something that I think people are getting a bit annoyed about. And okay, there are going to be some occasions where it is going to be understandable. Players pulling out due to family reasons. I think we had a, a player miss a flight. I think that might have been Jim Williams, actually. But I think the main gripe has been the high ranked players, your your going prices, your Michael Smiths, Peter Wrights that are playing in the Premier League, playing in the World Series events and then pulling out last minute from these events, maybe to take take the weekend off and look at their schedule. So I think that is something that will be annoying fans and, and particularly, as you say, fans that are going to these events that are living in Germany or, or living in Hungary or whatever. And, you know, they're looking forward to going to see those players and then pulling out last minute when the fans have already bought tickets to maybe go and watch their favourite player. Maybe they are a, a going price fan or a, a Michael Van Gogh fan and, and they're not getting the opportunity. So that's a, a lot of games that we've missed out on on the Euro Tour this year. And we're probably going to see a few more, aren't we, in these next two events. But I think it is something that does need to be looked at. And I think when we do get to the end of the Euro Tour, it is something that the PDC will look at and hopefully we'll see a, a fix. I don't know what that fix is. Maybe it is going to be the host nation qualifiers going back to the night before, but I think we'll see something change for next year. I'd, I'd certainly hope so. I, I know something you mentioned that uh, one of your listeners suggested was, you know, fining players that pull out with no reason. I I don't think that's the way to go because, you know, these guys at, at the end of the day, you know, it comes to the debate they're having in golf at the moment where, you know, are the players employees or are they independent contractors? So if they're employees, then yeah, they're, you know, effectively not turning up for work, but if they're independent contractors, then they would be free not to play if, circumstances changed or you know they didn't want to but I think for me it comes back to kind of two things the the main one is working out when the deadline is for players to confirm whether they're playing or not because to me it seems to be pretty late in the day it's almost sort of half an hour before they're going to do the draw or whatever they have the final list of players and then they just go from there I wonder whether you've got to bring that earlier in the week uh, so those say Premier League players have got to make a decision. Do I want to go to Stuttgart or Leverkusen or, or wherever if I've been playing in Brighton in the Premier League on Thursday? Well, they might not want to that week. But I wonder whether you bring that deadline forward and then develop a system where you can bring in replacement players, whether that's through working out reserves during the qualifiers you're doing as you do them now, whether that's you move the host nation qualifier to the night before or you do something using the challenge and development tools. But I think there's got to be a system in place where there are reserves lined up. So you're not left in limbo if Darren Webster says two days before that he's not going. Um, now, those players probably have very valid reasons all for not going, and I don't question those. But I just think the PDC have got to do something to ensure that the integrity of the competition is there and the value for the spectator is there as much as they can. You know, as you said, they can't control withdrawals that happen in the tournament if you become ill or you know your personal circumstances change but they can certainly do as much as they can pre-tournament to make sure they've always got 
48 players for these sort of important events for them as they go around Europe during the middle of the year. Definitely. And guys, get in touch. Let us know your thoughts. What would you do to fix the problem of the bias that we've had in the Euro Tour this year? Well, we'll get on to talk about the World Series in a moment, but let's get to our first guest on this week's show. He is the main man behind the sportsman management company. Here's our chat with Mac Elkin. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by the boss of the Sportsman Management Company Limited and the first ever weekly darts cast manager of the year, Mac Elking. Thanks for the time again, Mac. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, mate. It's um, been a bit of a busy period, but getting time to relax. So, yeah, all good at the moment. Thanks. Good to hear. Well, yeah, there's lots to catch up on since we last had you on the show back in March. And let's start with... The weekend just gone in Germany. We had Dimitri Vandenberg get to the final, Jose de Souza get to the semi finals, the two of those meeting in the semi finals. And I guess most importantly, our listeners will want to know how is Dimitri at the moment because he had a, a medical checkup before that semi final. Is, is he all good now? Yes, he's, uh, he's okay. Um, he went back when he got home, he went to the hospital, had another checkup, uh, ran a load of tests, and they all come back okay. So, touch wood. Everything's good. He's going to have further tests with his own GP, but at the moment everything's good and he will be playing on Friday or Saturday, should I say, at the World Series in Amsterdam. Good to hear. Well, sticking with Dimitri, it's been a busy year for him on the hockey, off the hockey, but on the hockey, two titles on the World Series. He had that late call-up to play in Australia and New Zealand as well, semi-finals of the World Match Play. How pleased have you been with Dimitri's form so far this year? Like you say, he's won two, he won back-to-back uh, World Series titles. It's just changed supplier now, um, so he's now with Target. So we didn't know what to expect the weekends. So to get to a final, it, it blew our minds. And those darts, he was scoring amazing. As soon as he gets the confidence and hits his doubles, I think we're going to see a lot of big things from Dimmy. You mentioned the change of supplier there. Dimitri was with Unicorn for a long time and, and last week the announcement that he switched over to Target. I guess two parts to the question. How hard is it as a manager to keep everyone your side quiet and not spoil the announcement? And I guess as the manager who's involved in deals like that, what's that like to sort deals like that, changing manufacturers? Do you know what, Alex? It's quite difficult because I'm friends with both um, suppliers, obviously. Um, you, you build a friendship over the years but I think he, he was getting stale at Unicorn and that's no disrespect to Unicorn because they're a great company but Dimmy was just getting stale and a bit lethargic and needed a change and now he's gone to Target he's freshened him up and he's really excited and I'm really excited to see what comes from it as for keeping it quiet I'm not sure we did that very well a lot of people seem to know <laughs> But uh, he was one of the worst kept secrets out there. But it is difficult, obviously, because one person finds out and they love to be the gossip and tell somebody else and then it just snowballs. But that, that's life, you know, you have to accept that. Yeah, his announcement, that won't be the, the first or the last to have a lot a lot of people guessing. And um, Dimitri, he was the, the one that ended Jose's good run at the weekend. Of course, we saw him have a, a good run in Blackpool at the World Match Play, get into the quarterfinals. Good to see him get back to some form again. Yeah, it's fantastic for me because I was I was getting a little bit worried about him, but he's putting the work in again, which is good. Um, I think I think he, he may have the delay and everything. I think it affected Jose more than it did Dimmy, although Dimmy was the one that was ill. I just think when they came back out to play, Jose really struggled and he couldn't find a, a treble twenty at all. So, but I'm I'm really happy with his form and, and Dimitri's on top of that as well, of course. Sticking with players, I guess, at the top end of the rankings in your stable, that the highest ranked of them all at the moment, James Wade, off the hockey, just become a, a dad for the second time. But when you last spoke to Burton, you said he was enjoying his darts again, something that I always advocate. But you've got to go to New York with him, that the World Series, that the Premier League this year, that the World Cup. What's it been like being on tour with James this year? It's been great, mate, honestly. It really has. It's hard work, don't get me wrong. It really is hard work. And it's tiring, but I wouldn't change it for the thing because while I'm working hard, it means the players are doing well. So that's good. Uh, and as for James, yeah, he's, he's putting more practice than he's ever put in before. So I'm just hoping that everything comes together 
at the end of the year and he gets that form back before he was ill. He was playing fantastic and for me, he was probably one of the best players in the world at the time. He won two of the Premier League nights. So, yeah, I'm hoping he gets that form back just at the right time now. Now the big TV majors are coming up. Well, we mentioned the World Series. We saw you present the Carl Anderson Trophy to Gordon Mathers. What did it mean to you to be a part of that presentation for a trophy that was made in memory of Carl? Alex, when, when I arrived in Australia and they approached me and asked me, they said, would I do it? It was a massive honour for me to do that. Honestly, I, I couldn't put into words what it meant to me. I did say at the time, I don't know whether I could do it because it's going to be quite emotional. But we done it. We didn't actually do it on stage. We done it off screen, although it was all filmed and everything live and everything. It, it, it was just a surreal moment for me to, to present that trophy, in, although it was in New Zealand. But that was the last place Kyle won a World Series. So it, it was a huge moment for me and a great honour, especially to represent his family as well, because they're great people and I miss them a lot. Yeah, a fitting tribute to a, a great man and a, another player we've got to mention on your stable is Keegan Brown. We saw him win his first Pro Tour title recently, first one in, in seven years, his second one. And firstly, his interview that he did after the final with Dan Dawson, Dan mentioned that you and Glenn Durant were messing around in the background. So what were you two doing? Right, first of all, Keegan's not with us, Alex. He sits with us, he, stay, he rooms with us, he does everything but he's under a different management, like an adopted son to our family. <laughs> but it was, it was great for Keegan to win because I secured his scorecard again for another year, which was brilliant because he, he was on the, the edge of losing his scorecard and he was down. And like I say, we, we've adopted Keegan as one of our own, so he sits with us and we try and lift him and that. And sometimes he beats our players and it's the wrong thing to do, but it's just the way we are. As a, as a Dart family, we take certain people in. Damon Hetta, obviously, Keegan Brown. So if they win, it's great for us as well. We, we, we enjoy the experience as much as they do. Fair enough. Well, apologies to Keegan, uh, an easy mistake to make. And uh, I mentioned Glenn, obviously, still in a, a tough run of form. And when you last spoke to Burton, you said that Glenn's not giving up and he's got your 100% backing as well. And if he does finish the year outside that top 64, has, has Glenn given you any indication on, on what his plans are for next year? Do you know what? We're not even talking about that yet because we think that he can still get in. I know it's going to be tough. It's going to be really hard. But since I spoke to Burton, Glenn's put 10 points on his average now, which is a lot. That goes a long way for the kid. Um, obviously, he's going to have to go to the World Championship qualifiers. Until that's done and dusted, and then, like, as the saying goes, until the fat lady sings, we're not going to do anything yet. So we're not going to talk about anything until the end. Well, one of your newest signings to your stable in the last few months has been Justin Van Tegawa, a player that burst onto the scene with those two World Youth titles in the BDO and injuries have hampered his progress since then. Talk to us about that signing because he's a player that's still got a lot of potential in the game. Yeah, if... I mean, well, obviously, I watch close, um, Justin closely, and sometimes at the youth or the development tour, he's throwing like 97 to 100 average, and he's throwing easy, but then sometimes he struggles a lot. It's going to take time for him to come back, mentally especially, because he was a good player and he's used to winning. And all of a sudden, when you start losing, your confidence, as we've seen with Glenn, your confidence goes rock bottom, and it's so hard to pick yourself up. I always say it's easy to get to the top, once you're at the top, it's so hard to stay there. Because once you get a knock and people start not disliking you, but feeling glad that you're losing and so on and so on. A lot of people love a loser. When you're losing, you'll have lots of friends. But when you're winning, they'll stab you in the back as many times as they can. They'll talk behind your back. So with Justin, it'll take a lot of time and we'll give him time. We don't expect things to happen overnight. And the same with the other youth players. We'll always stand by our players. When we spotted them in the first place or when we signed them in the first place, we see something in them. We're not going to give up after the year or two on any player. Well, we are now into the, I guess, the, the business end of the season in the PDC. Events pretty much every weekend and a, a lot of the big ones as well finishing off with the World Championship. And for the players, it is such a important part of the year for various reasons. What's it like for you as a, 
a manager to manage all those players that have got various different goals but this is such a, a big part of the season do you know I thrive on it Alex I do because I always think and I've said this before that one of my players can win a tournament so I get excited every single player even if one of my players is playing the other I'll, I'll speak to both individually but I will not sit in the crowd and watch that game I'll sit in the players room because I don't want anyone to look over and think I'm supporting a certain player every player to me is on the same, it's the same equal and I want them all to win and when they play each other, it's really difficult because obviously I have a winner who's ecstatic and I have a loser who's, it, it, it could be his world championships gone or whatever. So it's a really difficult time, but something I've got used to over the years and I suppose experience shows me what to do in that situation. So I do, I thrive on the situation of, uh, of the big TV tournaments and having so many players and the more players in it, the better. I love it. Definitely. Well, we don't have Burton with us this week. He's uh, away on his holidays. But the last time you spoke to him, you said that next time he sees you, he needs to get you fish and chips. It's been a, a few months since then. Is there anything else you want to add to the order? Oh, after last night, definitely get a Middlesbrough shirt. <laughs> I love it. I was, I was looking forward to looking forward to ribbing him. Cardiff don't beat anyone yet. They go to the Riverside and they beat Middlesbrough. I love it. <laughs> Good times. Well, Mac, it's, it's always a, a pleasure to catch up. We appreciate your time and we wish you and all your players all the best for the rest of the year as well. Alex, thanks, man. Keep up the great work. Brilliant show that you put on. I love being on the podcast. Just one last thing, mate. We spoke about Kyle earlier. I'd just like to wish him a happily, happy heavenly birthday for today, mate, please. Thanks again to Mac for joining us now on to the World Series concludes this weekend with the World Series finals in Amsterdam. Which first round ties, potential second round ties, have caught your eye? I guess I've got to start by saying that I'm not the, uh, what you would say is the biggest fan of, of the World Series. I think they often fall in a, a period of the year where I kind of, not lose interest in darts, but I feel that it's a quiet time for darts. And I've always struggled to, to enjoy the non-ranking tournaments. I don't know, they just don't have the same kind of, intensity for, for me as a viewer but it's been good to see them back to normal this year and going out to Australia and, and New Zealand because I know from interviewing a number of players from that region that these events mean so much to them so it's good that they've had those opportunities back and, and the PDC players have had the chance to to go overseas again and, and kind of delight those crowds it, you know in what are effectively uh, glorified exhibitions I guess there's also questions about whether the World Series should be reformed. And I know Paul Nicholson said some stuff on that this year. Uh, but yeah, either way, you know, going to this weekend and it should be quite interesting because I think it will be a good barometer of where we're at. Because I think this is the first time these top eight are going to have been in the same field for, for a little while because, uh, you know, various people being off or ill or not playing in the World Series and so on. So uh, it, it should be quite good. I think in terms of times that have caught my eye, uh, I, I think Leonard Gates, Devin Peterson will be quite interesting in a way because Leonard had quite a poor weekend on the CDC, got one quarter final and then a couple of early exits. And he certainly doesn't seem to be playing at anywhere near the level he was when he qualified for Alexandra Palace a couple of months ago. And then on the other hand, you've got Devon who... I know he was on your show a little while ago and he spoke about sort of making changes to his game and plugging away. And you've seen flashes and hints of that at the Pro Tour, but I don't know that he's playing at a great level either. So that could be a bit of a, a tricky tie in a way because it's going to be one that's won by the guy who, you know, steps up and sort of grabs it by the, the scruff of the neck, as it were. Uh, I think Jamie Hughes against Dave Chisnell will be really good because I think Chizzy's playing very well. Jamie Hughes is always very capable. Uh, so that should be a really good high scoring, you know, good scoring power game. And the other one, well, I suppose there's two others really that have caught my attention. One, you know, it's the one at the top of the bracket, essentially. Danny Baggish against Ryan Joyce, because Baggish had a good weekend at the CDC. He won a title, ensured his place at Alexandra Palace. He's got a lot to play for. And while it's not ranked, a good run this weekend could set him up well for, for what's going to be important a few months as he desperately tries to hold on to his tour card. And he's going up against someone in 
Ryan Joyce, who also needs a big last few months of the year. Ryan's not in a world championship place at the moment. Uh, I think he's only won about 20 grand year to date on the tour. So he's not had a particularly strong year. But again, a win here. You then play Dimitri in the next round. There's potential for you to go on a bit of a run here. And, and that could give you huge confidence going into the last pro tours, the last Euro tours, and then those big televised events that are in the rest of the year. And I, I couldn't, of course, uh, wrap up yeah. my thoughts without mentioning my main man, Hopai Puha. Hopai's had a brilliant year and he's a top bloke. And I'm delighted to see him get this opportunity to come out of New Zealand again and uh, play some big televised darts. And you know what? He's got the game to beat Dirk, and I think he's got the game to beat Gary Anderson as well. So really excited to see Hopi in action, and, and I hope he has a, a good weekend because, uh, yeah, he's a hardworking bloke and he deserves those breaks after some tougher runs on the stage earlier this year and, and you know during the pandemic. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Hopi there because he's someone that is making a, a lot of strides this year, isn't he? He made a, a lot of finals, winning titles, playing better on TV as well. The game he had against Johnny Clayton a, a few weeks ago, probably the best we've seen from him on, on TV since he started playing in these TV events and, and playing World Series, playing World Championships. And who would have thought he'd be one of the invited players for this World Series finals, but fully deserved and great to see him get that opportunity to come over in. And hopefully his journey will be a lot better than it was when he played in the Players' Championship events. I was listening to your interview you did with him a, a little while ago, and that sounded like a a bit of a nightmare. So hopefully it will be smooth sailing for him getting over and getting to play. But for me, the ties that I'm looking forward to, I guess really is going to be the most popular pick from darts fans. And it is the one that's got the star names that the name power, if you like, and that is Valent Sherrick against Peter Wright. It's the tie that everyone will be talking about since the draw was made. And I guess really based on recent performances, you'd say there's more high quality ties out there in the draw, but we all know Valent Sherrick, she has got the game to compete with these top players in the PDC and particularly Peter Wright as well. You only got to go back to last year at the Grand Slam. They played in the quarterfinals and, and Fallon averaged, what was it, 98, 99 across 29 legs in that long format and just lost out in the end to Peter Wright. So we know that she has got the game. We've maybe not seen it as much this year. And you look to the World Series this year, I think her highest average she's had is 89 and, and they've mostly been in the low 80s. And if he brings that game this weekend, then... You'd say Peter Wright, who we've just seen win on the Euro Tour, it's going to be a comfortable evening for him. But we all know that Fallon can raise her game and hopefully we'll see her do it again and, and raise her game and, and give Peter a close game again. But aside from that, one of the ties that I'm looking forward to, and it's a, a tie that's between two players that have won titles on TV this year, Simon Whitlock, the World Cup, against Danny Noppert, who won the UK Open. And that's a, a really interesting tie to start off with the first round. And I was going to give a mention as well to that, Leonard Gates, Devin Peterson game as well, because you've got one player who is, okay, he didn't have a, a great weekend at the weekend, as you mentioned, but we are going to see Leonard Gates in the World Championship at Ali Pali. We are going to see him in the Grand Slam as well in, in a few months. And he's someone that he is always enjoyable to watch on stage. He's someone that just loves playing darts. And we're now seeing him a, a lot more on our screens, which is good. And for this event as well, okay, not as serious as a, a Grand Slam or a World Championship. So, will be good to see him before those two events, see where his form's at going into those events later on in the year. And Devin Peterson, yeah, he's someone that has dropped off, hasn't he, since this time, probably around this time two years ago, when he was winning on the Euro Tour and he was getting to the semi-finals of the European Championship and someone that was pushing towards that top 16. He's had a, a slide since then, but to get into this event, he's had to come through those qualifiers, win three games, and that will give him a, a bit of confidence coming into this because, again, he's someone that likes performing on the stage, going up on the stage and playing in front of the fans. And, you know, this is an opportunity that he might not have expected given how things have gone in the last 12, 18 months. But he is going to get that chance this weekend. And who knows, could be the start of a, a turnaround for him. Yeah, for sure. And I guess of the the seeded players, you know, I would say that in some ways, the way James Wade is playing at the moment and, you know, he's not being quite how he was playing before he had that medical scare a few months ago, I guess of the eight seeded players, he might have been the one that was considered maybe the most favourable. If you were looking at the draw, I'm not saying anybody you know wants to play a certain player or doesn't want to play other people, but he might be someone who's still not quite 100%. So if you can win that first game, get the confidence up, 
you might then be able to, to spring an upset and then suddenly you're in the, the quarterfinals, you're getting to play a best of 19 on the telly and you can really give a good account of yourself in that longer form game. So, as you say, it could be a really big weekend for, for Leonard and, and for Devon. And yeah, just something I wanted to mention on Hopi as well. Something he said to me earlier in the year was that when he's come over for TV events in the past, he's often found it difficult to adapt because in New Zealand, all of their tournaments start with a group play or, you know, round robin phases. So it means that your first few games are all best of five and you're often the highest ranked player in your group. So that functions as your warm up so that when you get into the knockouts, you've already played four or five games. Whereas here, he's being caught cold essentially and he's got to go from you know the word go and that means that he's just making a slow start and then you know wasn't able to claw it back in the PDC world Lakeside he battled back against Ben Hazel in, in a bit of a slog and then just couldn't see it off in that third set so I think he's getting more and more stage experience I think the Australian Open earlier this year where he got to the final helped and I think those World Series events, as you mentioned, helped as well. And he played very well against Johnny Clayton. And it's all about believing and achieving. And he's got those wins on the stage now. So he, in theory, will come into this in a better place than he would have done if this event had been run this time last year, for example. Well, maybe an easy fix for help I could be to bring me and you, Andrew, to the World Series this weekend, play both of us in a best of five, beat us both 3-0 and get mm-hmm. those easy games out of the way and it'll, it'll be warmed up for the, the game against Dirk. But yeah, still a chance if you want to bring us over, help I will be happy to join you. But um, let's get on to the predictions because at the moment, the weekly darts cast tip of the year, that is something that is up for grabs and Andrew will give you an opportunity to potentially put your name in the hat with a, a good pick here. We've got Dimitri Vandenberg, the top seed, this weekend, we've got the world champion, Peter Wright, one of the unseeded players. So it's a bit of a, a random draw, really, for, for this weekend. But who do you fancy to lift the title? I'm going to go a bit rogue now. The person I think is going to win is Dave Chisnell. So right. I thought he was very unlucky not to win. Uh, he was unlucky not to win that Euro Tour, not this one, the, the one before. He played very, very well and uh, played well at the weekend, just gone. And I, I don't know, I've just got a feeling about him that, He's going to win one eventually. And uh, I wonder if it's going to be this weekend and then maybe like it has been for, for a Joe Cullen or a Johnny Clayton, winning an unranked event on TV can then be the kickstart to more success in the ranked televised events. So I think I I could definitely see him, you know, beating Jamie Hughes, then going through Joe Cullen and then likely going to play Gezi in the quarterfinals. And if he can win that, I, I think he's got a decent chance. But if it's not him, I I would say that I think Peter Wright's got a very good chance as well. Also, Michael Van Gerwen's going to be fairly well rested coming into this tournament. And uh, he certainly showed signs earlier in the year that he was close to being back. So, yeah, I, I would say MVG's in the mix. Peter Wright's in the mix. But you know what? I'll go out there. As Alan Smith once said, if you don't buy a ticket, you can't win the raffle. So I'll say Dave Chisnell. And now hopefully that puts me in the mix for tip of the year. Fair play. Well, if that comes off, we'll uh, we'll send you the certificate and the Blue Peter badge in the post straight away because I don't think anyone will top that. But yeah, I'll, I'll probably go for a, a little less rogue pick for me and I was just having a look at the draw. And, you know, it is difficult, really, isn't it? The first couple of rounds, first to six legs, it is a, a short race and you have got the players in the first round that are going to get that warm-up game, if you like, to then play one of the seeded players the next day. So that can sometimes work in their advantage. Sometimes it, it can't, but I'm, not often these days we see the same final two weekends running. And I was thinking maybe we could see a Dimitri Vandenberg, Peter Wright final again this weekend because Dimitri got to the final of this event last year, played well. And of course he won the world series in the Netherlands early this year as well. Maybe it is something about the world series in the Netherlands that does bring out some of Dimitri's best starts and, even though he wasn't feeling at 100% of the weekend, still managed to make the final. But you mentioned him, Marco Van Gerwen didn't play at the weekend, but you look at the success that he's had this year with the Premier League, with the world match play, he's won more titles than anyone. And to get a title in front of his home crowd this weekend, I think would be a, another tick in the box for him. He'd, he'd love to achieve that, but he is in one of the toughest sections of the draw. It's potentially Damon Hetter in his first game. Then it's going to be one of 
Simon Whitlock, his nemesis, or Danny Nopper or Johnny Clayton, just to make the final session on Sunday night. So that's going to be a, a tough little section of the draw to get through. And I was thinking of going with Dimitri to get to the final, but I guess I've talked up Michael's chances, uh, given what he's done this year. And if he is going to get through a, a tough section like that, then fair play to him. And I will go with Peter Wright in the bottom half of the draw. And I remember this event, one of the, the few memories I have of the World Series finals is the two first finals that we had back in 2015, 2016, and they were held in Scotland. And it was Peter Wright against Michael Van Gogh. And you had that hostile crowd going against Michael. And both times he managed to win a, a tight game. So maybe it is the the heart rule in the head on this occasion. It's going to be Peter Wright returning the favour from those two finals six or seven years ago. And we're going to see Peter Wright win the World Series finals for the first time. So I'm, I'm going to go a little less rogue. I'm going to go with Peter Wright to win the title this weekend. We'll come back in a moment and we'll look at some darts away from the PDC. We'll look at the WDF, we'll look at the ADC and we'll look at the Modus League as well. But before then, we had our good friend of the show, Matthew Keane and the darting nerd. He was over in Cardiff a few weeks ago for the Champion of Champions and we're going to play a few interviews from Matthew's time in Cardiff. Well, it's Saturday the 27th of August and I'm delighted to say I'm in Cardiff for the Champion of Champions uh, finals day sponsored by Red Dragon Darts, of course, and Worthington's and a whole list of other sponsors that you can find in the description. This tournament's been on my bucket list, I think, for a number of years now because it's a very special one, really, because it evokes the old News of the World format that obviously we know lots and lots about. Yeah, it's a wonderful event because there's 256 qualifiers here. They're playing best of three legs all throughout the day. They've qualified from all over the UK and indeed one from Germany. That's uh, Franz Roche, who I'm hoping to speak to a bit later. I'm currently in the smoking area, which is obviously a very good place to get uh, interviews uh, if you go to a darts event because they can't run away from you, which is always useful. Uh, and I can't actually get the interviews inside the depot because it's absolutely... Uh, heaving and it's extremely loud as well it has to be said because there's music uh, blaring out so we don't want to get dumped for copyright um, so that's really exciting so hoping to speak to a number of players out here uh, hopefully some willing victims <laughs> and uh, I'm also going to film a number of the matches on board 16 I'm here until about half five can't stay for all of it but uh, should be a fantastic day and uh, really well, just really looking forward to it and really hope it goes well. So I hope you enjoy this. Bob Owen, always great to see you and thanks for joining us on the, on the weekly Darts How are you? Uh, all good, but um, all fit and ready for the next uh, trap of the Modus Challenge Show and Pro Tour. So uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, lots, lots happening. A very busy calendar for you. Um, yes, very busy. Um, I'm actually going to do the... Uh, Ifracum WDF uh, in September, the week after Challenge so um, basically just try and try and sneak into Lakeside as well so might as well give it a go and see how it goes. Spinning a lot of plates so that's what I like to hear. Tell us about the qualifying event for this, uh, the Prince I believe uh, In the Prince, yes um, I beat a couple of good players, I beat um, Tim Jones, old teapot uh, I shouldn't have won that game I will be honest I played rubbish but in the final end I played a good youngster back from us now uh, Steve Ink Penn, uh, he's one to look for the future. Uh, very solid, solid player, and um, I'm hoping he'll use his head and come up the ranks now because he's brilliant. But I beat him, but I'll take it. I'll take it. What are your highlights from this year that you can pick out for us? No, I've got so many highlights this year. I, I played Pro Tour, Challenge Tour, you know, I, I, I played the Modus League, but um, the Modus League is one of the best leagues I've ever played in. The, it's, it's harder than Pro Tour. I don't care what anyone says, it's harder than Pro Tour. And to win, not just one, six or seven of them is, is amazing, but, you know, it's all part of the game. Absolutely. And what do you make of the format? I know you were just telling me off, off, off mic, actually, that it's quite nice to, to come to these things with the local co community in as well. Um, yes, yeah, the, the Red Dragon Champion Champion, it's always a big tournament, it's 10,000 winner. But, you know, it's um, for me, it's... 10 grand, 10 grand. If you win, you win. It's lovely. Nice little day out on a Saturday. But I'm, I'm here predominantly today to play dart, maybe win, maybe lose. But I'm here with my, with my friends, which I haven't spent spent a lot of time with in probably the last 12 months. So it makes a big difference to me. That means a lot, doesn't it? Fantastic. Well, well, thanks so much for your time as always. Good luck today. Thank you very much, bud. Well, Scott, thank you ever so much for joining us as always on the weekly Darts Cast here at a slightly different event. Uh, 
as in terms of the events that we normally go to. Yeah, my first time in Cardiff. Lovely weather, it's good. Happy to chat to you guys anytime. Absolutely, and uh, well, it's, it's great to have you. And the Champion of Champions format, best of three. Never been here before, you did qualify. Can you tell us a bit about your trip to Staines? Uh, my trip to Staines was a bit of an impromptu one. Um, we got back from, I think it was either another event or maybe a holiday, one or the other. And when we got back, my other half, Beth, said to me, um, we should go to Staines. I was like, what? She's like, well, it's, we're in a heat wave. It's going to be 30 odd degrees outside. So no one's going to be there. I was like, okay, right, let's go to Staines. I might, we might qualify for it easily. And it didn't play that way. It, as the time got on in the evening, I was like, oh, no, one's, no one's really turned up. And a sudden, a few good players come through the door. And then Aaron Turner, who I ended up playing and beating in the final, walked through the door. And I was like, oh, really? But, um, but no, it was a... It's a good experience. Best of three is very cutthroat. It's a bit of a lottery, really, of who's going to win and who's not going to win. But it looks like it's going to be a well-run day, and they've got nice music on the go as well. They do. That's why we're out here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's great when you're in there. How's life on the PDC tour as as a as a whole? Eight months in. Um, it's great. It's great to be fair. I mean, I think including the Euro tour I have coming up, I think I've just touched fourteen thousand now on my order of merit which isn't bad from the first year I don't think a lot of players that are a lot higher than me earn a lot less on their first year but I mean I'm, I'm, I'm trying at the minute to recapture the form I, I had when I made that semi-final early on and things like that so I'm sort of I, I went forward really fast so I, I've, I've got to sort of recapture what I was doing then and I'm, I'm playing some pretty good stuff in practice at the minute so hopefully it starts coming on the, on the main board I've just got to stay positive because it, it, it's it's the best thing in the world being a dart player. In in reality, like when I was a kid, I wanted to be a dart player for a living. It's it, it's one of those things you can't you can't moan that I've got a tour card and I'm not doing very well because it's it's almost ungrateful because you've gone out there, you've won one. Like it's you still you've got to work hard and you can't be disheartened by it. You just you just can't. It's just not one of those games where you can let yourself get down in the dumps about things. Yes, lots of people would love to love to have one, wouldn't they? Including a lot of people in this uh, in this room. Um, your semi-final, presumably on the on the Pro Tour, still stands out as a highlight. Yeah, it has to because I haven't really done anything since. <laughs> um, unless you count losing in Euro Tour's first round as highlights, which I don't really. Um, but no, yeah, it, it's it's a massive highlight. I mean, to be fair, I think one of my biggest highlights has got to be my second ever Pro Tour, and I've played Brendan Dolan, won that game, played Jim McEwen, and I think I lost to Martin Schindler in the board final, possibly. And then the very next one, I made the semi. And then the next day, I played Steve Lennon, beat Steve Lennon. So I've, I've had some good wins. I've just got to, I've just got to keep digging deep. That's all. But it's at some point, it will just come natural, like it does to a lot of the like old-time pros that are there. Absolutely. And just your hopes for today and thoughts on the format. Um, I'm hoping I win the whole thing. <laughs> because I've got a wedding to pay for next year. Congratulations <laughs> on that, of course. Looking forward to that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. Love it. Well, thank you so much for your time, Connor. Good luck today. Thank you very much. Delighted to say we're joined by Simon Hall, Marketing Director at Red Dragon Darts. Simon, uh, how are you? And have you recovered from the event on Saturday? Yeah, just about. It was an exhausting event. It was quite hot there as well, which was, we can't control the weather. So much as it was great to have a, a beautiful day, it did get a little bit warm. Um, and the event was massively well supported. So we're so grateful for, for everyone who came to, to support the event. It was a brilliant day. Can you give us an idea as the logistics which goes into an event like that, and the, the planning and the, and the timelines? Because, of course, it doesn't happen overnight, does it? No, and uh, this event now has been running, I think, since 2016 can't remember exactly so the idea about the whole event is to bring back the magic of the news of the world and that was one of the main tournaments that kicked off what televised darts is today um it gives any person in the street a real real chance to really achieve something at the highest level and, and carry on um so the learning the logistics of it we've 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 done it year in, year out, and got a little bit better here and there every year. The first year we did it in Port Call with eight boards. It was just, we were inundated and couldn't move. And, you know, we've now gone to 16 boards on our third venue. The In terms of logistics, you there is so much you don't see. Even 
even to getting the 16 lanes on a wall, the frames, the banners, the advertising, the marketing in place, you know, requires a team of probably, well, if you include the markers, you're looking on the staff on the day is 70 staff to put an event on. And I think, I think it's easy to underestimate just how big an event, how, how, how much it takes to run an event with over a thousand people in it. Um, so, but before then, the logistics as well, that we are running qualifiers in pubs that we don't run personally, but we have to oversee them, make sure they got the branding, make sure the players are registered. So you've probably had this year uh, around 5,000 registered players with many of them playing multiple events. You've got all the admin coming in, all the winners, all the questions and queries. So it, it's for us, it takes, it's, it's a four month program for us um, and it culminates in the final. So yeah. That that's a bit behind it. So hugely rewarding then, because obviously that is a lot of a lot of work. It is hugely rewarding, but more so because I think we see we've always we come from grassroots. We're still obsessed with grassroots about you know real people who play the sport, and to see to see those people get an opportunity from their local area to come to a final. That that's the most rewarding part, and everyone you see on the day. All of our staff, from from me, MD, all of we're all on the floor. There's no one, you know. We're all totally accessible, and uh, and the feedback we get and the kindness is that you know, that that's a real reward for us as well. Absolutely, I, I a couple of highlights from the day. One was seeing Franz Roche, who'd qualified from Germany, which was pretty amazing to see. And I think the other the other highlight was seeing uh, John Davy, who'd been to ten qualifying events just to get there. Um, what were your highlights from from the day? Yeah, the, the the German uh angle was quite a good story because we we sponsor a player and he's based out in Germany and he asked about the tournament. So I sort of said, look, we've had a lot of, of interest from further afield, but what happens is the further afield they go, the more pressure it is on a single person to come to the event. So I sort of said, look, really you should run an event where you pay to enter and actually cover the guy's air flight and his hotel, which they did. So he came. So so to have a German player was a massive highlight for us, absolutely massive highlight. Um, to ha- really, the highlight for me is another new winner. I mean, that's, you know, you had Jim Williams was still there. He was going strong, you know, so we were to have another new winner. And, and I think the feeling is that we can run this for 50 years and we'll get a new winner every year because it is such a brutal format. So um, the quality, the quality of the darts all around was a highlight. The, the fact that it's it's become it feels more like a festival of darts than just a darts tournament, um, and we are trying to work towards bringing that feeling. You know, Bobby and Colin they were they added a bit of stardust to it, and uh, yeah, and and the whole event flowed really well. You know, there was there was no break in play; it was continuous, and and you know, it was a a very very a lot of action packed into a quite a short space of time eventually. And I guess. Uh... Planning for next year probably starts pretty quickly, I guess, does it? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll meet with the Worthington team probably towards the end of this month. We'll review all of the uh, the whole tournament from top down all the way through logistics to what we got right, what we got wrong, what we can improve. So we'll have a we'll have a very very in depth review of the the event. We've already done that internally, so we'll do that with our partners. Um, and then we'll look bef- to, to see what we'll plan for next year then. So, yeah, so that that that's again, now it's all of a sudden it starts straight away again. We're, we're back on the chin. For us, though, I mean, one of, the, one of the potentials, and I think it will start nudging towards that, is the social media and coverage and engagement and the amount of people involved now from outside the event. It's starting to push yourself to need some more external coverage as well. Because I think... There's quite a lot of those games and stage games that darts fans would genuinely like to see. Well, that that brings us neatly on because a, a personal thank you for myself uh, to 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 you, Kerry, and and, and to Dion for for having me because um, I filmed Board Sixteen and uh, some great games, <laughs> you know, right up until um, the, the board winner. So uh, I look forward to sharing those with you. So so thank you for for having me. Just. Lastly, uh, I was talking about Red Dragon. If there was a product that you would recommend to our listeners uh, to have a look at, what, what would that be? 
Ooh, it's a tough one. There's, there's so many. It would depend where you stand. If you're um, really, if you want so many dart players that we deal with are really, really highly skilled, highly knowledgeable. Um, we do get a lot of people new to the game and those who are, um, but I think we all share one thing in common. And I think we all, all want to play the game to the highest of our ability in the smallest space of time with the most minimal effort. And that there's no there's no one set of darts that can do that but in terms of i would say a product to keep you to get a dead straight throw would probably be the sight right unit uh, and that that is probably overlooked in darts the basic nature of that so you know that for me obviously you need a decent dart board to play on and a good set of darts that you feel comfortable with so but if you want to get if you want to get the best the quickest in a short space of time i'd probably go with the sight right because that's that's what helped me the quickest. So, love it. Well, Simon, thank you ever so much for your time. Much appreciated, and congratulations to you and the team again on, on a great event. And uh, hope to be there next year. Brilliant. We look forward to welcoming you. Thanks again to Matthew for those interviews, and we'll get the rest of them out on a future show. So go and have a look for them when we get them out. And we'll finish up the show as we said at the start. We've got Andrew on, who of course follows a, a lot of darts away from the pdc so let's have a look at the general landscape of things at darts underneath the pdc and we'll start off with the modus super series which was launched early this month as a follow-on from the online darts live league what have you made of it so far yeah i feel like i'm very similar to you in the sense i know you've spoken about this on you know under the 128 with matt and so on that you're not an avid viewer of the uh, modus super series or the online darts live league as it was I just, it's not, I don't have any problem with it. I just don't think it's ever been something that I've felt compelled to watch. Uh, you know, either it was on when I was at work, so I wasn't going to be watching it, or it was on in the evening when maybe I was doing something else or I was getting my dance fix elsewhere. But yeah, I mean, you can't deny that the, the Online Darts Live League had a very positive impact on the sport, for, you know, for players outside the PDC because... You know, initially when it was the, the playing at home league, you know, it kind of it came at a time where there wasn't a lot of darts going on and a lot of people were putting the darts back in the cupboard and, and packing it in for a little bit. And they came in with something that, you know, initially was there to sort of give the, the mode players a bit of match practice, essentially. And then they brought in more and more. And then it grew into the, the online darts live league where they were playing in a broom cupboard. You hear players speak very positively about it i know i got a couple of pelters earlier in the year when i made a comment uh bashing it a little bit but i know you do hear players saying that you know the match practice you get in there you know where it was in southampton it was basically just a room where there's you your opponent and the referee and you can just go in and play there and i remember sean mcdonald said to me that if you couldn't concentrate and play your best starts or close to your best starts in that setting you wouldn't be able to do it anywhere because it was the perfect environment. You didn't have people shouting. You didn't have random tannoy announcements. You weren't getting bumped as people walked off to the bar or whatever. It was like practicing at home, but with an actual opponent with you. So, yeah, I mean, it, it did a lot of good. And you see that a lot of players who have played in that have kind of gained form and have then gone on to either win a tour card or they've done well in the WF events or challenge tours and, and so on. So it's been a big thing. And... Yeah, I suppose the next step was turning it into this super series where you can have a live crowd and kind of scaling it up, as it were, as a project. And I don't know. I think I was baffled initially with the announcement of the super series because I looked at it a couple of times and I thought, hang on, isn't that just the same thing it was before in a new building and with a new name? Uh, and that's not to knock it, but it seemed as though the announcement was of something bigger. And I, I wasn't sure that it necessarily was. But either way, you know, you're seeing a few different players get involved. I know Moreno Blom, a young Dutch player who's had success on the WF Tour this year. He's been playing this week. And uh, someone we both know, Lee Schoen, the cobbler, he'll be in action later this week as well. So it's good to see more players getting an opportunity and it's a great resource. I guess my only comment on the new setup is that it does look a bit weird in the weekday sessions, the little bits I've seen where the venue they're playing in is obviously empty. So you see all the tables have got the black cloths over them and so on. And uh, there's no fans in the room. So it does look a little bit odd. 
some ways looks like old BDO majors where they didn't have any fans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, other, other than that, it's uh, still very, very professionally run, very professional setup. And I like the changes they've made with the presentation as well, where you've kind of got a, a presenter or a host now as well as the, the commentary team. So no, I, I, I think it's a very good resource, but I know just for me as a, a dark viewer and consumer, it's not something that I will go out of my way to watch. Yeah, I think there was more fans in there today. We were recording this on a Monday evening, so the Monday morning session, there was more fans in the venue than there was for the World Masters at the Circus Tavern. That's how, uh, no, I'm joking. But uh, no, it's, it's been good to see. And, you know, you've got to say, first of all, fair play to the guys at Modus, because this is something that started out, as you say, during the lockdown players playing at home online. To then we had the, the mystery room in Southampton with no crowd. And now we've got that bit of atmosphere for the finals on Saturday and one of the key taglines really from the press release about the the name change and what they were going on to do is a million pounds plus prize money per year and you've got the TV coverage of course it's always been on YouTube as well now you've got the crowd as well in there so that's uh you know it's a lot of positives isn't it and as you say when this event is on and the, the press release, it said the mode of Super Series delivers strategically timed content running morning and evening sessions from 9.30 GMT and 2200 GMT. So like you, I'll be, I'll be working in the mornings and Saturday evenings, I'll be tucked up in bed. I might catch the first couple of games, but the final at 1.30, 2am in the morning, it's, uh, it's difficult to stay up for that. But there is an audience for it. They are getting decent numbers on YouTube. I'm not sure what the, the TV figures are, but there's decent engagement as well on social media and if you are a player who doesn't have a tour card on the PDC you've got aspirations to play on the tour one day then you would be silly not to want to put your hand up and say I want to play in this event and I guess really that that's probably my main gripe with it at the moment is how players are getting into this because we've seen various names over the last two years it's a, a good platform for them to test themselves against other players of similar standards, similar goals. And the plus point is you don't have to go traveling all over the country, across Europe, wherever to chase points. You've got all the players in it. They're getting paid regardless as well of how well they do. So there is a, a lot of positives behind it and the rewards are there. But I guess really the other side of things, the other argument is how does a player get into this? How do they cut through? And with all the other names of, of players that don't have a tour card and get that opportunity to play in it, that's something that I'd maybe want to see a bit more transparency on, on how these players are being picked and how a player can get picked into it. Because you mentioned him there, Lee Shewan, someone that we've wanted to see playing it for a long time. He's finally got that opportunity. Now, maybe that was due to work commitments, other commitments, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, it'd be good to see maybe a, a clearer structure on how these players are getting picked and maybe we'll see some other things come in where there is qualifiers or there's a certain criteria to get in but yeah I think maybe a bit more transparency on how these players are being picked would be good because at the end of the day we want to see every player that's good enough get the opportunity to play yeah ex exactly I think that's something a lot of people would be keen to see I know when the press release came out I saw someone saying that Oh, that means that there's 12 weeks in every sort of block before you get the Champions Week. So that means that 12 different players a week for 12 weeks, that's 144 different players. And then it quickly became apparent that it definitely wouldn't be that many players because if you didn't say get through in the first week, you might then get another go in week seven or, or whatever. Um, and I know the modus players, you know, modus signed players have contractual appearances in the league as well. So they obviously are going to get a, bit more of a run out than someone who isn't one of those players so yeah I think some more transparency on how they're picking the players would be good but by and large as I said we are starting to see more new faces get into that fold as I said Moreno Blom and and Lee Shewan but a couple of weeks ago good friend of my podcast Martin Turner the Mutts Nuts he was on there as well I know it didn't super go his way but he got a run out as did Darren Johnson so there are starting to be different different people getting involved. And I think it's one of those things, once you've had a go once and you've shown your ability, there's a good chance of you getting another crack. But it's actually getting that first crack in the first place. I think a lot of players want it. They just don't know how to get there. Uh, so if there was more visibility on that, that would that would be really good. It shouldn't just be a case of who you know that gets you in there. Definitely. Well, let's get on to a subject that I know you'll know a little bit about, and that is the WDF has been fairly quiet as far as 
announcements recently for their next major events. Of course, we've got the World Masters due to take place in December next year's World Championship. We don't know too much about that at the moment. Should we be concerned about the lack of info we're getting at the moment? I mean, yeah, of course you should. I mean, the players are, so why shouldn't fans as well? I mean, I'll probably get put on the naughty step for saying this, but it's not really good enough, is it? Because players are chasing these events all year, chasing points, working towards a ranking table on the proviso that there's a world championship. Well, it shouldn't be on a proviso. It should be that they know that the tournament is on these dates with this much prize money, and this is how you qualify. Now, they know how they qualify because, you know, that's not changed from last year. But at the moment, the World Championships, I'll start with that one, they don't know when it's going to be. Could it be January? Could it be February? Could it be another time in the year? Is it going to be at Lakeside? Is it going to be somewhere else in the UK? Is it going to be overseas? It shouldn't. We shouldn't be in, in mid-September, effectively, of, you know, three and a half months away, and none of those questions have been answered. I know Richard Ashdown and Nick Rolls have said in the past that they don't want to announce things until all the the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And I respect that because that was a mistake of of previous BDO administrations. But you have to feel for the players. They've got to be looking at the British Open this coming weekend, the England Classic the following weekend. And then in October, you've got Northern Ireland. And they must be looking at those thinking... You know, do do I just back that it's definitely happening, that I definitely need to go to, to Bridlington or I need to go to, to Northern Ireland? Or do they just sit and think, actually, I'm going to give this one a miss and wait and see what happens? Because at the moment, they, they don't know what they're playing for. And then on the World Masters, that one's less than three months away. And it's not actually been officially confirmed. We don't know that it's 100% still happening, whether those dates are the same, whether the venue's the same what the exact prize money is going to be, what the format is going to be. And, you know, players have got to book travel. And I said this on my podcast the other day that you need to confirm this stuff so far in advance because if you're someone in New Zealand that's qualified for the World Masters, you've not qualified for the World Championship, you've qualified for the World Masters, that's your big event of the year. That's your reward for planning events and maybe having a good run. It's bloody expensive to come from New Zealand to the UK or to the Netherlands. So you need to be able to book your flight as far in advance as possible to try and get the best deal possible. These people have got jobs. They need to take annual leave. They need to book holiday. And they need to be able to book it in a way that's actually affordable for them because realistically, they're going to be running at a loss in this tournament. You know, unless you come over from New Zealand or Australia or America, and you win or you get very deep in the tournament, the chances are you're making a loss on this. And I feel we're in the position now where players are just going to have to take what's available, and that means running a a bigger loss. Or they just say, actually, you know what? The climate we're in, the world we're in, I can't afford to come. So then they just sack it off, and then the field's not as good as it could or should be, given that you've got a longer qualification period than you would have had because you've got events from 2019 and 2020 and 21 and 22. Plus you've got nations giving out wild cards and players from the ranking table and regional ranking tables and so on. And, you know, the the World Masters, the way they've redone it, it should be a really good event. And at the moment, players don't know if it's happening or not. And, you know, my concern is for the players first and foremost. I don't think it's fair. So I would hope they come out with something very soon on both of those. Uh, I mean, chances are they might have done it by the time this podcast goes out and then I look like a right mug. <laughs> but I I really don't think it, it's fair on the players. And I, I suppose to keep on this sort of tangent I'm going on now, if you say that the Men's World Championship, you know, the World Championship, regardless of men's, women's, is now in February, not in January, well, how do those players feel that have committed to the tour all year on the proviso that I'll qualify for the World Championships first weekend of January, same time it's always been, and then I'll go to Q school. What happens now? There's there's not a guarantee that the PDC grant them the same exemption they got this year. Good chance that they don't, because February's maybe a more busy time than April was. So then you've played the events all year. You've gone to Denmark, you've gone to Sweden, you've gone to Belgium, you've gone here, there, and everywhere chasing points. And ultimately... For what? 
okay, yeah, you've got your tour card. That's great. But you were trying to qualify for a world championship. You spent your money. You've spent sponsors' money. You spent your management money. O- on what? And so yeah, I just yeah, I think it's very frustrating, and I feel for the players. But I, I, you know, I would think the WDF's in good hands with Richard and Nick, and I have faith in them. But you know, they need to pull their finger out, as it were. Yeah, I think you're spot on, and as as you said, you know, the WDF right from the get go when they took over putting on these events that the BDO used to put on, they said we're not going to announce things until they are 100 percent confirmed. But I think the silence at the moment is worrying, and particularly for the players, of course, because they're the ones that are putting out their time, their effort, their money to play the tour and try and qualify for these events, but also the fans as well that want to go and watch these events follow the WDF tour and uh, get tickets as well. You know, it's with what we now five months since we saw Neil Duff win the men's world championship, Bo Greaves win the women's world championship. And we've had events since then where players can get that automatic spot into the world championship next year, but we don't know where it's going to be, when it's going to be. We don't know anything, do we? So it is a concern that we've got this far down the road and we haven't got any details about the World Championship yet and whether it's going to be at Lakeside, whether it's going to follow the World Masters and and move outside the UK to the the Netherlands or somewhere else, we just don't know at the moment. But particularly as well, as as far as the the race to get to the World Championship, we don't know when the calf's going to be, if it's going to be after the the World Masters and then we come into the, the World Championship in January or if it's going to carry on into the start of next year and it's further down the line. But I know we helped the WDF out with their rankings last year with the, the race tables. And since the, the Lakeside, we've not heard anything from them. If they want us to do it again, you know, we're happy to help out any organisation. We, we do this in our spare time. So if we can help anyone else out to help the game get better, then we're always happy to do so if we've got the time. But it all seems to be very quiet at the moment. So like you say, and we, we've said it, Burton and I and, and Matthew and I as well, we've spoken about this in the last month or so, is that we are hoping that by the time this show comes out, we are going to look silly and there will be an announcement. But as the weeks go on, the months go on and the silence really continues on the World Masters, the World Championship, there is going to be that growing concern. And we've spoke to a, a few of the players and they don't know what's happening. And when you get to that point, it is a, a little bit concerning, isn't it? So hopefully we're going to see some news soon, as, as always say with these things. And we'll uh, we'll get back to looking ahead to these events and talking about who could win them, who could do some damage and not if they are going to happen, which, you know, in any organisation, that is a concern when you're talking about things off the hockey rather than on the hockey. Yeah. And I think something I would like to point out as well, I'm not, you know, I cover that organisation and that side of the sport because I do genuinely care. I care about that system and I care about those players. And I'm not moaning because I want to bash the WDF, there are certainly people within the, the darts community who do. And uh, you know some of the people I'm talking about when I say that. I'm not like that. My issue is this was supposed to be the same system that existed before, but in a better way and with more responsible leadership. And I feel at the moment that's not necessarily materialised. And it's the players that I feel sorry for because... As I say, they are investing their time and their money in an environment where it is getting increasingly expensive to go and travel around Europe doing these events. And it's, you know, what what are they playing for? At the moment, they're playing for a World Masters in December that they don't actually know is 100% going to happen when it's supposed to happen. And at the moment, there is no World Championships on the calendar. If you look at the, the WF website and the calendar for next year, there is no world championship on there. It starts with the Las Vegas Open, goes into the Dutch Open, and then you've got Scotland, and then, you know, not a lot else on there. And then you've got the World Cup at the end of September. In theory, the WDF Europe Cup's going on the end of this month. But, you know, where's the world championships? I know you helped them with the ranking tables last year. I've been helping them with written content on the website last year. I was there helping them at Lakeside. I've been helping them since then. And uh, it's like, I'm happy to help, but there is a bit of me that's thinking, you know, I'm writing a monthly recap of who's done what and where, and I don't mind, but 
I, do I put in there that they've qualified for the World Championships? Because when is that World Championships? I can't say they've qualified for Lakeside because I don't even know if, if there is a World Championship, if it's going to be at Lakeside. So I don't know. It's frustrating. And I, I don't want to be in the position where, you know, comments are taken out of context and it makes it sound like I'm saying or you're saying that, oh, there isn't going to be one because we just don't know what's happening. It's not, a, oh, it is or it isn't. There's no scoops here or breaking news. It's just a case of we know nothing and the players know nothing or they know snippets of something, but one player's snippets are different to another player's snippets. So, yeah, deeply, deeply frustrating at the moment, but fingers crossed there's a, an update of some kind soon. Right, we'll finish up with a look at the ADC and the unfortunate news recently that their World Open in December has been postponed, citing the cost of living crisis. What was your reaction when you saw the news from the ADC? I mean, I was a little bit surprised. I actually think when I saw the news, I just finished listening to your show under the 128 and I was sat in Dusseldorf Airport and uh, I think I was messaging you to say, you know, I really enjoyed the listen or whatever. And then either you or Matt sent me the link that it was cancelled. And I was like, oh. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I was surprised in some ways because it seemed as though they were building momentum. I know they'd been running qualifiers for the event. They had one in Italy. I think they had one or two in, in Iceland for the Scandinavian region. They'd got the ones in New Zealand and Australia booked up as well. And it seemed as though they'd, they'd got a bit of momentum and were building towards a, a decent year of, of their repackage. But obviously now that's gone. And I, I suppose that poses problems for them as an organisation because, again, you've had a year of, of players going to your significant events and then the the the, the flagship at the end of it, you know, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, as it were, has now gone until till next year. So that's uh, obviously going to harm their growth, I would have thought, or, or at least lead them to stagnate a bit for a while. Disappointing for those players, obviously, who were looking forward to playing in it or who had registered or whatever. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I'm a very cynical person, I think. So when I see things, you know, from, from a company or whatever, I always sort of think, is that the real reason? Or, you know, I would like to interrogate whether that's the entire truth of it. The same when the WDF moved their world championships. I thought, well, there probably is some truth in the fact that you think there might be COVID restrictions and you can't really play the tournament behind closed doors, so you'd rather move it just in case. But you've also not had the greatest ticket sales, so that's probably a factor too. And again, seeing them citing the cost of living crisis, I thought was interesting because it's definitely a reality. There are people in darts, within darts organisations who I've spoken to very recently who've said that the cost of living and general expenses of day-to-day life are concerning them for, for the long-term future of darts, county darts, for example. It's going to become harder and harder for counties to justify travelling the length and breadth of the country. You've got, you know, last season you had Northumberland and the Isle of Wight in the same division. There are similarly long travels this season for, for Cornwall. Anywhere they go and play, they've got to go a very long way. Same goes for, for Devon. And I know that they've looked in the past, there was a suggestion that they did things on a regional basis. So you had a Southern League and a, and a Northern League and, and you worked the divisions in that way. Uh, that was part of the Tri-Nations proposal. I, I wonder whether that's something that they go back to if they're that concerned about finances. I, I don't know if that is a concern of the UKDA, but I would imagine that it, it might be on their radar. I think there is legitimacy to that, but you also wonder whether that's the, the whole truth of it because... I think if you had interest, you would still run the tournament anyway. You wouldn't cancel it because you're worried about players not being able to afford to come because presumably some of them have have paid their fees already or I'm not entirely sure how it would have worked, but I feel like they would have allocated that money already or they would have been playing in your events on the proviso that they would be playing on that event at the end of the year. So... I guess they would have budgeted for it. I don't know. I, I was surprised to see it cancelled and I was surprised to see it cancelled for that reason. And I do wonder if there's something else there, but uh, that is a factor. And I think it's something worth bearing in mind, that cost of living thing, because I know Tommy Thompson, the president of the, the EDO, he said to me during the pandemic, he said to me, darts will probably never recover from this. 
because there are going to be so many players who stop playing because of COVID and then just don't go back to it. And there are going to be so many pubs that shut that used to play darts and then people aren't going to come back to them. And I think that is the reality of where we're at now. And I do think it is a real concern for the future of the sport at a grassroots level. And I, I think it goes beyond county. It goes beyond England. It goes beyond the, the you know the ADC because I think the WDF tour, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, is becoming increasingly unsustainable for players. You can't in this climate, unless you've really got more money than sense, afford to traipse around everywhere and do every event. It's just too expensive. Even if you're getting good deals on flights and hotels and so on, and you're winning a lot, it's still too expensive. And I could definitely see next year, if it's similar to this year, I think I was working it out earlier, in the, the UK and Ireland this year, there have been, I think it's 12 or 13 WDF ranked events. Bear in mind, you can only have 10 boxes of points on the ranking table. 13 events could easily be enough for you for the whole season. And then maybe you look at it and go, and maybe I'll tag on a European trip that's quite cheap. I'll go to Hungary or I'll go to Romania or I'll go to Italy right at the end of the season if I, if I need a handful more points. And I wonder if more and more players are going to do that. And, you know, you see fields go down. So maybe this is the start of a, a trickle that we're going to see for a few years to come. Or maybe, you know, it, it's kind of part of a wider issue for them. I'm not sure, but uh, I guess that's my thoughts in a long and rambly way. <laughs> no, it is definitely interesting, isn't it? It's probably the first time we've seen the, the cost of living crisis, which, of course, has been dominating the news away from darts, the, the regular news, of course, but the first time we've really seen it have an impact on darts in terms of a, a big event like this. As you say, this was going to be a, a flagship event for the ADC to finish off the year. I think it was going to be held in December and there was a, a good pot of prize money going around for it. So it is a shame that we've seen the event cancelled and I was just having a, a little read up of the, the press release as well. And you've got Steve Brown, the ADC chairman, saying that entries were going great but have fallen off a cliff over the last three weeks with the daily news of the expected rising costs everyone is facing this winter. It would be financially reckless to commit to such a huge event using sponsors of good money to host an event nobody can realistically afford to attend. And he also says we've built some unbelievable momentum and will continue to focus on our affordable regional formats and leagues for the remainder of 2022. So for me, it was a surprise. I think for a lot of people, it was a surprise. But I guess really the ADC, this is their, what would you say, version 2.0 coming off the back of MAD. And it has been a, a slow build for them this year. And they have built some momentum with the, the championship tour, which we've spoken about a few times, which by and large has, has got a lot of great feedback and it is a, a great selling point for the ADC going forward. But the, the World Open, having everyone there for the, I think it was going to be a five days or a week and the cost of staying on the accommodation, entering the events, all the, the costs that come with it, the, the food, the, the drink, everything that, that goes around it would have maybe been too much and especially around that time of the year with it being early December coming into Christmas as well. So who knows whether this is going to be the first of many events we see have that impact. And we were just talking about the World Masters. That's going to be held in early December as well. Will the, the cost of living crisis, will that, that have an impact as well on the entries for the World Masters, the players that come over and play in it, especially given that, you know, we're, we're three months away and, as you touched on earlier, players looking to book flights to go to the Netherlands and not having that certainty that the event is going to be going ahead and having all the details that you'd usually get with these events. So it was interesting to see that and got to give the, the ADC some credit. I mean, you know, it is a, a new organisation starting out. They have made mistakes when they were MAD, but they have learned from those mistakes and it is difficult to break into the mainstream, cut through and some areas we are seeing them get on board with the ADC. Some they've decided not to at the moment. The World Open, that was going to be a, a big event for them. And I, I think with any organisation, when you have that first event, you want to make it as, as big and as special as, as you possibly can. And we, we saw that with the WDF when they cancelled their for, first World Masters for different reasons. But um, yeah, I think you know they want to get it right, the first one, and, and make it a success. And for them, if that means postponing it for a year, having another year, to build on what they've done this year and, and try and get more people involved, more countries involved, more uh, regions across the UK involved and, and get a bigger turnout, get more people involved next year. 
then we, we could be looking back at this in, in 12 months' time and saying what a great decision it was to, to push it back a year. Definitely. And I think, yeah, I mean, it was good that they cancelled it so far in advance, essentially, before certain people had committed too much in the, in the way of resources. And, you know, it's good in the sense that they were certainly striking the right tone that the players were being put first and they were making a realistic decision for, for them and their sponsors, but also you know, for, for players playing in a big event only a few weeks before Christmas when we know money is tight for, for everyone anyway. And I, I think they do, as I say, I think they deserve a lot of credit as well this year because I think their approach this year has been much more sensible than it was when it was MAD. I think MAD, of course, everything was skewed by the, the pandemic, but I think they tried to do too much too soon, tried to, to run before they could walk, as it were. Whereas I think this year it's been a lot more strategic. It's been a lot more deliberate in what they've done. And they've tried to start off at a lower level and then build up to those big ambitions that are still there for, for Steve Brown and the rest of the team. And I think they deserve credit because the, the tournaments that they've run themselves, not the things that are run at a local level, but the things they've done themselves, the, the championship tour weekend have received near universal praise from the players that have been part of them. The setup looks fantastic in the, in the pictures that have been shared. Of course, they've had the, the streaming element. They use the darts atlas. But everyone's saying that it, it does feel like a professional experience and it feels like the, the professional experience that they're promising it's going to be. And that applies overseas as well. They had their first weekend in Australia, the weekend just gone. And all the Australian players I, I know that played in that, I've seen them posting on Facebook or Twitter that it was a brilliant weekend. It was a really well-run weekend in, in Geelong the tournaments were professionally run it was a good format the players got the most out of the weekend and they're looking forward to playing in the next one so they certainly are putting the feelers out uh, and in many ways as I say that cost of living crisis is going to be a big factor and it is going to have a big impact on darts across the UK and 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 wider than that and maybe this is the first sign of that um, so yeah it, I guess it will remain to be seen whether you know, it was the, the right decision and they are able to, to sustain that momentum. But I guess part of me was a little bit cynical when I first saw it. And I know some other people were as well. And I think that's a good thing, though, because I think you should be able to challenge things like that and, and ask those difficult questions because we should be able to have an open and frank conversation in darts. And it shouldn't be that if you express opinions or whatever that, that people don't agree with, you're then consigned as as something or uh you know you're not respected in the same way so um as i say it's disappointing for, for them of course as an organization and for the players that are looking to play in it but hopefully it's just a bump in the the path for them because it's certainly more opportunities for players is always going to be the better outcome so hopefully they can continue being a fixture on the dying calendar as they have been this year Definitely. Well, in the absence of Burton this week, it leaves me to ask the question to you, Andrew. Anything else for this week? That's all from me, buddy. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to, to come back on the show. Good to have you on. And as we have got you on the show this week, to, to give you a, a plug for your podcast as well, Inside the WDF, uh, a great darts podcast. I, I listen to it every week, every chance I get. And um, yeah, congratulations on recently getting to the, the 100 episodes. I'm sure we're going to speak before um, six weeks' time, which is when we're going to be playing at the O2. Uh, we're not going to say it's the Indigo at the O2. It sounds better if we say it's at the O2. That's what I'm telling everyone anyway. But me and you, Andrew, we are in the list of entries. It's, it's starting to build up the, the list of entries, the star names in there. But we are going to be playing in the very first Viking Cup, the Andy Fordham Memorial Tournament at the O2 in, in six weeks' time. Um, yeah, how's the practice going? Are you excited to, to play in, in this big event in a few weeks' time? I'm very excited to play for sure. Uh, practice is currently slightly non-existent, but I will admit that I'm uh, harbouring an injury at the moment. I've uh, had my foot strapped up recently because uh, I've got an issue with the, the instep of my left foot. But uh, hopefully I'll shake that off and uh, get the arm turning over very soon and uh, come into the O2 in bristling hot form. That's the hope anyway. That's what I like to hear. Yeah, really looking forward to that in uh, six weeks' time. 
didn't realise it was six weeks' time until we were we were chatting on Sunday. But yeah, we'll soon come round. Looking forward to that weekend. Should be a, a good laugh, and hopefully we'll throw a few good darts in there at some point. But uh, yeah, leaves me to say thank you to our guests for joining us, to to Matthew Kin and for the interviews that he sent over while he was in Cardiff a few weeks ago. We always appreciate that, and big thanks to everyone for listening. As always, appreciate the support, and hopefully we'll be back again next week. Hopefully we'll have Burton back. If not, we will try and get a, a guest co-host to chat with me next week week and uh, look back on the on the world series finals and look ahead to the the euro tour that the dart season it is the the busiest time of the year for the pdc lots of darts to talk about and there's only one thing you've got to do and that is enjoy the darts <laughs>